All right, uh, thanks so much, Greg. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk today, uh, again, working with web APIs in Swift. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Dropbox, which means I work on our uh, developer platform team. Um, we don't always wear costumes, um, but today is a special day. Um, and so we work on Dropbox APIs. Um, so a big announcement today, and I, I know you guys have heard a lot of announcements about APIs from Twilio this morning, uh, but we also have uh, an announcement. Uh, we have a new API, uh, version two. This is actually really the second version of our uh, main API, which we call our core API. And the first one was released several years ago, and so this is uh, a nice departure and something new. Okay, cool. So API v2 is still sort of considered a preview in that we are talking with developers and kind of opening up as a conversation about, you know, what should the next generation of web APIs really look like? And we're trying some experimental things. For example, um, we're trying out that everything, every request method is a post. So even in the case where you traditionally use the HTTP get method or some other method, we're trying to do everything in post. And that's rather controversial, um, but kind of interesting. Also doing JSON for the request and response bodies to so know URL encoded parameters um, and no form encoded body. Um, but everything is JSON. Fewer HTTP status codes um, from our previous versions of the API, and instead having, uh, for errors, more descriptive, human-readable error messages. And also just doing some general cleanup. And on our blog, we've published a lot of posts about some of these concepts. And uh, we'd love it if you'd check that out and give us feedback. What do you think? Is this crazy? Should we be doing more restish APIs? Uh, is going with something new exciting? And so we've only built a handful of endpoints so far for API v2. Uh, we have sort of what you'd expect to do with Dropbox. So for your logged in user, you can get their account. You can actually get the account for any user, Dropbox user, uh, if you know their user ID. Uh, and you can do things with files. So you can get the information about a file with Git metadata. Uh, you can list all the files in a folder using list folder, uh, upload a file, download a file, and we just recently added a new feature to Dropbox as a whole, which is to be able to do full text search over files, and that's available to our pro and business customers, and we've also added an API endpoint for search. Um, so another big announcement today, just today, we announced API v2 a couple months ago. The big thing today is uh, we made a new SDK, and our first SDK for API v2 is in Swift. Uh, and it's called Swifty Dropbox. So what does Swifty Dropbox gives you? Well, it handles most of these handful of API v2 endpoints that we've just released. Um, so the same stuff, uh, file operations, upload, download, search, um, and a couple more uh, to check it out. And we'll keep adding new endpoints to both the HTTP API and to the Swift SDK uh, as needed. So now that I've talked about Dropbox stuff, uh, a little intro to what I'll be talking about for the rest of my talk today. Uh, so I talked about Dropbox. I'm gonna talk about iOS. Uh, I'll be talking about Swift. And I'll be talking about the Apple Watch. So pretty exciting. Bunch of new stuff. So this, this is by far the uh, most cutting edge talk I've given as a developer advocate at Dropbox. Uh, so I have a sample app today that I'm going to walk through, and we're going to look at some code, look at some Swift code in action. Um, and the app is PhotoWatch. So it's basically taking a folder in your Dropbox, um, looking at the contents, finding all the photos, um, and then showing those photos on your watch. So I'll do a quick, quick demo using the Elmo, which I haven't used before. OK, cool. OK, let's see. Ooh. Zoom, focus, awesome, okay. I hope you all can see this. Wait, let me focus again. Focus, no, okay, zoom, focus. I don't think this is made for the watch yet. Okay, so here's my app. You see it's a little fox. You found it? Do, do. Yay! Here are some photos from my Dropbox. There's my friend's cat. There's some food. These are very Instagram type photos, but they're actually my Dropbox. Okay, there's some. Okay, cool. All right. 
it's a pretty simple app. Um, probably not a lot of use for it, but it's kind of just a simple little demo app. All right. So let's talk about how, uh, how you go about building this app. So of course, right now, uh, when you build Apple Watch apps, it's sort of expected that there'll also be uh, like a phone or a tablet component to the app as well. Um, I'm hoping that in the future, it'll be easier to build sort of watch-only apps. But right now, you're sort of tethered to the phone and run a lot of the code on your phone. And that's sort of the way things are done at this point. Um, so I built a companion app uh, for Photo Watch. And I'm going to run it for you now and show to show you what the component app on iPhone looks like, and then like walk through the code a little bit. OK, so the first step uh, when interacting with Dropbox is you're going to have to have your user log into Dropbox. So I'm just going to log in as myself here. And then I can choose which of my Dropboxes, because I have a work Dropbox, to link it to. So I'm going to actually choose to link it to uh, my work account Dropbox. And here, actually, you can see the folder for this app. And before I log in, I'm going to put a couple more photos in this folder. So I have, so here are some of the folders, or some of the photos that I want to show on my watch. There's my cat. OK. Cool. So let's link it. Awesome. So now you can see, you can kind of see in the console, it found all the contents in my Dropbox folder. Um, and now it's downloading this first file. Um, there it is. And then you can download another file, download a third file. OK, and then as you can see, these are nice and cached, so you can kind of see. OK, so that's what the iPhone app looks like. It's kind of just the same as the Watch app. Not terribly different. OK, so to get started with the Swift Dropbox SDK, uh, I just need to import it. And we actually have some instructions for how to install it using CocoaPods on our blog. Um, and there's the GitHub URL for the project itself. OK, so once it's all installed, uh, the first thing that we want to do is uh, register our app with uh, the SDK, so you'll need to go to like the Dropbox developer console, sign up for like, hey, I'm going to build an app. Um, I called mine Photo Watch. Uh, I filled in some information, uh, and I'm good to go. And I get back this app key, and I can use my app key to sort of register with the Dropbox Auth Manager. Um, and I'm doing that here in my uh, app delegate in the uh, did finish launching with options. It doesn't really matter where you do this. Um, I usually put it in the app delegate just to get it set up. It doesn't really do anything other than initialize and say, oh, we're going to be working with the Dropbox API. Um, and then here's where we're actually going to do some action. So somewhere in your application, when you uh, link with Dropbox, your I don't know what happened to my so Oh, here. This one seems to be working. Uh, you're going to want to say, uh, OK, the user clicked some button that says, like, link to Dropbox or log in with Dropbox. Um, and then I'm going to want to actually present like the way to log in. So you saw that window pop up. So this is the code that does that. Um, the shared auth manager or authorized from view controller and whatever the view controller you're in is probably the best one to use there. OK, so I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, uh, OAuth 2 on iOS. And OAuth is quite dear to my heart, so I care a lot about uh, user authorization on mobile devices. So OAuth was sort of built for the web and as a way to authorize from one web application to another web application that has like an API. Um, so sort of the traditional way that you think about it is sort of switching apps in a browser. So mm -hmm. the initial way people think about doing OAuth 2 on iOS is, oh, OK, we'll just switch out to Safari. And Safari will go to Dropbox.com, and they can log in there. Um, unfortunately, Apple tends to uh, reject apps from the App Store that do this, does the, or that do this flow um, and says, oh, it's a bad user experience. We don't want to be taking users out to another application to log in. 
So instead, Apple recommends that you present that web view controller. The thing that you guys saw when I was showing it on the simulator, that's what Apple tells you to do. Um, but to be fair, that's not super secure, right? Because one of the ways that users verify that it's not a phishing scam, that they're actually going to Dropbox.com, is that you can look in the URL bar uh, and see that it says Dropbox.com, and you can't really do that with a WebView controller. Though we still do this, and a lot of apps will do this for OAuth. It's not super secure, but it's kind of the best that we have for now. Um, Dropbox, actually, in uh, our APIs, we made uh, something called dauth, which for Dropbox auth, um, and we switched to the Dropbox app to log you in, which is really great if you have the app installed and you already are logged in with Dropbox. It's a super fast process. It just says, hey, do you want to authorize this app? You say yes, and it switch, switches back. Um, this is our preferred method. Um, currently, uh, the Swifty Dropbox SDK hasn't implemented this yet because it requires some work with our uh, client team, our iOS client team, to get everything working together. Um, but this will be coming soon in the future for our new SDKs. It just isn't quite there yet. And it actually is a much better user experience if the user has the Dropbox app installed. So we end up falling back to presenting a view controller if they don't have it installed. We don't force them to, to download the, the Dropbox app. All right, so the user is all logged in. Um, let's take a look at what it looks like to um, to sort of store that access token. So we have to, we're gonna get back from Dropbox um, an access token for OAuth 2, and we wanna store it someplace so we can keep using it to, uh, to make subsequent API requests. So we do this in the open uh, URL method in the uh, app delegate again, and all we have to do is check that this URL, if this URL is like that Dropbox redirect URL, and we have this method uh, handle redirect URL that parses all of the parameters that come back and, and saves them uh, in the Dropbox auth manager for you. And you can see here, uh, we're using a switch statement to look at the enumerated result. Um, and we either have a success result or an error result. And they both have uh, different uh, uh, objects that come back, um, either a token or an error object, which has an optional description. All right, so once the user is logged in and we've stored the token, uh, we can start working uh, with the Dropbox client itself and making API requests. So here's an example of initializing the Dropbox uh, client using the first access token. You can actually have multiple users or users log in multiple accounts uh, for Dropbox. So a lot of Dropbox users will have like a work account and a personal account. Um, and this allows the flexibility of you being able to have both accounts logged in and they can like choose which one they want to use for your particular application. But we just, for this particular photo app, we're just going to say, oh, you can use one Dropbox account uh, and log in with that. Okay. Uh, so now we get to the interesting part. We're going to list the files in this folder of photos. Uh, so we call Dropbox client, uh, shared client, list, uh, files list folder. Um, and that takes a path. So it could be like a subdirectory of the root directory. Um, and we get back a response object uh, and an error object. And we check the response. Uh, we loop through everything in the response. It's a collection of files or folder objects. And we check that, it, here I'm checking if it's a photo, because we, we want to sort of ignore if I put any other kind of files in there, not show them on the watch. Um, and then I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just adding the photo file name, like the path to the file, to an array of file names. Um, because what I really want to do is use uh, a UI page view controller to show those pages. So the UI page view controller in iOS will um, dynamically load those pages, kind of like a table view controller or other things. This is a pattern you see a lot in iOS. It's like, hey, we're not going to load the content until we actually need it. So I'm actually not going to do any of the work of downloading the photos until uh, we actually need to look at the photo. So instead, I'm just going to set, uh, I'm going to use the data source, and I'm going to say uh, the number of pages is just the number of file names that we have in that array which initially starts with zero, but uh, as, as I listed those uh, files, it got an actual count of the number of photos. And then the data source also has uh, functions to uh, display the next view controller and the previous view controller. I think I'm only showing one of them here. Yeah, the next, the after view controller. Um, and so what I do is identify like which file should be, it should be there according to the index. Um, and then I'm instantiating a new view controller that's gonna be that page. Um, and setting its file name property to the file name. And I'm not actually going to do any of the loading of the file until we actually view uh, the photo view controller itself. So here's the photo view controller. Um, and it has a file name, uh, which is the file that we want to view. 
It also has an image view just for displaying. It's a super view, simple like view controller. Uh, and I made it in uh, storyboard, so it's just like a big fat image. Um, and when this displays, we're going to actually want to download that file and display it. So here we are downloading the file at the file name, uh, which is actually a path. I probably should have called it file path, but since it's only one level deep, uh, it's the, also just the file name. And we're getting back a response and error again. Um, and our, actually, our response consists of two items, metadata about the file, so like information about it, plus the data for the file itself. Um, and then I'm using that data here to create a UI image, uh, cropping that image because we don't really want a huge image stored for either the phone or the watch, um, and then displaying that image in the image view. Now, it would actually be a lot better if I could only download a thumbnail instead of this huge file from Dropbox, because theoretically these image files could just be ginormous. Uh, but the API v2 preview doesn't have a thumbnails endpoint yet. We have one for the existing Dropbox API, but not one for our new API. So that's something we could do a little bit better. All right. So this is great. We're showing these images on the screen. But there are a couple of things we what else we want to do. We want to be able to cache the files so that they load really quickly. You saw it when we were like scrolling through the first time it was loading. It like had the spinner and was super slow. So let's cache them to the local file system. And we also want to be sharing them with the Apple Watch. So the way I built this app is basically the files are all downloading on the phone. So you kind of have to log in with the phone first and download all these files. And then uh, you will have the, the, your photo or the photos will then appear on your watch. They won't actually appear on your watch until you've logged in. So it's a little not the best uh, design. Like I may want to improve it so that like the watch either like gracefully kicks you out to like load the photos. Anyways. Uh, so we want to be able to share things. We want to be able to cache them. Uh, and the best way to do this is to use an app group. So the app, an app group creates sort of like a directory that can be shared between both your iOS app and your watch app. So it's perfect for what we're doing. Um, so this is how you create like your little app group. Um, and it talks to Apple's servers and gets everything, all the permissions set up. And you need to add this to both uh, the watch, or I needed to add this to both the iOS app and to the watch. So I just add the groups to both. Um, and then here's the code for actually storing the photos in the app group, and this is in the phone. Uh, so I can get the container URL or get the folder for putting these folders in, um, in the first line there. And then um, this is actually where I'm, I actually do the check to see, uh, like, oh, is the file in the app group already? OK. Uh, if it is, let's just display that, that image right now. Otherwise, let's download it from Dropbox. Um, and resize it, and then show it. And then let's actually save it back to the file system. So that's what this code is doing here. Um, and actually, this code is online, so I'm, I'm kind of going through it a little bit quickly. Um, but this whole project is up on GitHub, uh, so you can get it later. OK, so let's stop talking about the phone, because the phone is boring. Uh, let's talk about, uh, about uh, what's going on in the watch. So this is the main uh, view controller for the watch. Uh, or interface controller, I should say. Sorry, they renamed it. Uh, or Apple has renamed it to interface controller. So awake with context is the equivalent of my view did load in my iPhone app. So awake with, con or awake with context is where I want to sort of be doing all of the loading of uh, content for my watch app. Uh, so I'm getting my images from my app group. And I actually wrote a separate function to do this, which I'll show you in a second. Um, I'm getting, uh, or I'm, I'm setting all the data for each page. So actually, the default sort of look in the watch is sort of the exact same thing. It's just this page controller, right? This is actually like a top level kind of view controller on the watch because it's kind of an easy way to interact with the watch. It's actually most of my favorite apps so far uh, in, on the Apple Watch have been things where you just can like swipe to view them, right? It's the easiest thing to do. Um, so I'm creating my. Uh, uh, I, or I'm saying, oh, I just want a bunch of view controllers of this photo interface controller type. And the only data I need are these file names or these file paths. And then I update the watch display with these arrays of names and data. And that's sort of what does all the counting of the number of pages and updates the display. So here's uh, the code for getting the images from the app group. Um, Looks pretty similar to what it did on the iPhone. Uh, get the shared app group, get all the files, check that the file's a photo, um, and then add this uh, image uh, or the file name to the array 
or actually, I think I'm actually working directly with images here. So I'm adding the actual image to the data to be displayed in the, uh, in the page. So here's sort of what the page looks like. Uh, photo interface controller, it's super, super simple. It's just awaking and it's setting, it's only one object, uh, or it's only one interface component, it's only view, which is an image, uh, to uh, be that image. Okay, so let's see, I'll show you guys what that looks like in the simulator, because I, I, sh I already showed the, so let's run this in the simulator. Now let's not look at you phone. Here we go, here's the watch. Yay! So it's finding uh, my photos in my app group. Uh, they're a little slow to load. There we go. There we go. There's, some, there's our photos. So looking good. So those are the photos that are also shared with the phone. Nice. Very exciting. Okay. Okay, and as I mentioned before, so this is, this is kind of the end of my demo of this project. It was super fun to build. I had a good time working. This is my first watch app. Uh, and you can go look at my code and critique how terrible it is on GitHub. Uh, photo watch, uh, let me know what you think. Obviously there's room for improvement in this app. Uh, one thing that I'd love to do is have the ability to sort of like drag new photos into uh, the folder or remove photos from the folder and sort of have that update uh, more in real time and without having to like refresh it on the phone or anything like that. Okay, so let's talk uh, a bit about working with APIs in Swift uh, in a more general sense. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Swift programming language itself and then sort of the things I ran into um, when both working with the SDK and uh, some of the issues we as a team saw in the uh, SDK itself. So let's start with the basics. Uh, what's interesting about Swift is that constants are sort of like a first level item in that it really, uh, it's kind of a powerful tool for checking uh, if you expect a variable to change or not. So here's an example of where I used it in the resizing code for the sample app. Um, I don't really expect the max size to ever change. So I use the keyword let to say that it's a constant. So max size is this constant that I'm gonna be using throughout my code that sort of does, everyone's probably done this code for cropping and resize images and you always kind of have like, oh, I want the max width and the max height to be this. Um, so that's what that is. Um, and then the final size that I want to come out is a variable because it sort of depends on various factors and will be reset throughout my resizing code. So that's kind of a nice convenience that Swift has. Um, Swift also has optionals, which you saw in the code here. Uh, the ability for if something is nil, you can sort of do the assignment and the check right in the, uh, right together in one line, which is super nice, uh, great for APIs. Like this is one of my favorite features that really shines uh, with Swift and APIs because you don't know what you're gonna be getting back from your request to other services. It's super unreliable. So optionals are really great. Uh, and optional chaining, also really great for APIs. For example, this is my code where I'm getting back a file and I don't even know if it's an image or not. So let's say this first thing succeeds and I get metadata on data, but it may not be something that I convert to, be, to being a, uh, an image. And in either case, I don't care, right? So I'm gonna fail to an error in either way. So that's great for this. Uh, and then the other option, of course, is if it is, I'm gonna display the image. All right. Another cool feature, but kind of not as useful, is, well actually, having Unicode support be very strong in Swift is super useful, and super useful for APIs where you're getting data that you don't have control over. But less useful is maybe setting your variable names to something cute. Am I getting any, anything on the screen here? What was that? This one's back? Okay, hooray. <laughs> Well, I'm almost done, so I'll be quick now. Um, so another thing you do a lot, uh, obviously, with working with uh, web APIs is making HTTP requests. And as of iOS 7, uh, all I have to say about this is it's recommended to use NSURL session. Um, and for our particular SDK, we actually include our, we ha require Alamo Fire as a dependency just because it makes uh, doing the web requests uh, super easy. But there's actually a bunch of libraries now for um, doing iOS uh, HTTP requests. Alamo's kind of Fire is kind of cool because it's written in Swift, so it works really well. Uh, parsing JSON is also another 
big issue with web APIs these days. Uh, NSJSON serialization from Apple does a pretty good job. Uh, one of the issues that you'll run into with Swift is because Swift is strongly typed, and the types don't actually match a lot of the stuff that is going on with Objective-C libraries, you're going to end up with stuff coming back as any object, which isn't very helpful because it's not very strongly typed. So what we do in the Dropbox SDK is we make a pass over everything that gets returned, and we convert it to a Swift type. So converting it to a Swift string, a Swift int, that sort of thing, so that when you guys work with the SDK or when third-party developers work with their SDK, they're getting strongly typed Swift uh, variables back instead of uh, any object. Um, we didn't actually use a library for this. Uh, we were using Swifty JSON, but it wasn't updated for uh, one, Swift 1.2. So we're still kind of looking for, or like hoping that there'll be better JSON libraries in the future. Uh, so this is a concept uh, for iOS uh, and working with APIs in general, um, and SDKs in general, I should say, um, that I care a lot about. Um, so it's a pattern, using the singleton pattern uh, is pretty common uh, in iOS and singleton for a default. So for example, I'll show you what I mean by this. It's like a shared instance. We're using it for uh, Dropbox client and the Dropbox auth manager so that you can continue using the client throughout your view controllers, right? So this is like a way to pass objects between view controllers. There's several ways you can do it, but this has become quite popular for SDKs. It's just to let you create a singleton and then share that. Um, this is a tricky concept. So singletons are kind of hated upon, both in Wikipedia and in the developer community at large. I was like looking for more info to be like, oh, I really want to talk about singletons in, API, or in SDKs uh, in Swift. And it was like kind of disappointing because everyone really hates on it. And I think it's hated on as a web app pattern because uh, requests and responses are so, so short-lived, right? Like when you make it, when a user is interacting um, with a web app, they want to get in, you want to have that response come back as fast as possible, right? So you're not really keeping data around. Anything that's sort of like state for the web application is stored in your database, in cookies, in some sort of more long-term storage. It's not stored in your code itself. Whereas in iOS, when the user is interacting with your application, they're keeping sort of like a long-going connection to your code. So using some Something like a singleton is actually super useful um, and allows you to sort of like work with a, a single object throughout your view controllers. So I don't know. This is kind of controversial. It's something I like to do, uh, and I just wanted to mention it. And it's also something that's changed a lot in Swift. So in Objective-C, you had to do this kind of messy sort of shared manager uh, class method to sort of get that singleton. And Swift makes it super easy. And this is actually, Swift has like many ways that you could create singletons. And there's like blog posts, go out, read them, find them, about how to do uh, singletons. And this is uh, the way that we're using in the Dropbox API. But as you can see, it's like one line of code compared to an entire uh, block of code for Objective-C that I end up just copying and pasting in every place that I want to make a singleton. Whereas Swift, it's super, super easy. You just need to make like a static variable for your instance. OK, another thing that Swift does really well uh, is enumerations. And these are great for web APIs uh, because you can do some cool stuff with responses. So here's an example where the Dropbox auth manager, when we did that handle redirect URL, is returning an uh, enumeration. So auth result is an enum. And it actually has two different cases, a success case and an error case. Um, and like I said before, they actually return different things, right? So the success case, we want our token, which is an object that contains information about the user's OAuth 2 access token. So it has like the user ID, it has their uh, the actual access token string. Um, in our error case, we have an error object, which contains like the error code um, and maybe, a dis maybe some descriptions or other information about the error. And it also contains, uh, the response also contains a very human readable error description, which is great for debugging. You can just print it out. So here's what that looks like. In, this is actually in the Swifty Dropbox SDK code now. Uh, we de define that auth result, and on, here's the two cases, and tells what objects we're going to be returning. Um, and then you can see the function handle redirect URL just returns that enum. So I want to show you sort of the more traditional way of doing uh, API responses, which is to return objects that will be like a response object and an error object. And you can see here I'm handling those response error and ob error res response object and error object. And this code isn't super nice because I'm doing like if response is nil, if error is nil. And, so, and you can kind of do this anyway. You can say like, oh, if error do this thing, if response do this thing. Um, and the reason this code isn't super great is because the case where response and error are either both an object 
or both nil like make no sense, right? Like this truly is an enumeration in that we only expect to be getting one valid object back here. Um, you're never going to really have the case where they're both valid or both, or they're both uh, objects or both nil. That just wouldn't make sense. Uh, so we're actually looking for a lot of feedback on this SDK. Um, this, oh, I should mention that this is actual code in our SDK now. And like personally, I don't think this is ideal, uh, but we'd love to hear from you guys as developers about sort of what you think about different styles of handling responses. What do you think about we're, what we're doing in the Swift SDK? Is there anything that we're doing that's not Swift-like enough and that we should improve? So feel free to send me feedback at lee at dropbox.com and I'll relay it to our team. Um, Again, all of this code is on GitHub. Our blog post uh, will walk you, we just launched a, put out a blog post today that'll walk you through the Swifty uh, Dropbox SDK if you wanna like play around with it. Uh, the photo watch is like kind of a nice little watch example app you can play around with. Um, and we'd love to get feedback on it. Also, uh, if you have any feedback on the session today, uh, you can text Twilio um, and leave feedback. Let me know if you like the costume I'm wearing today or if it's silly. Um, I've never worn a costume for a talk before, so thanks. <laughs>